All right, my name is Alexandra P. Wilson. I am a political science major, an African diaspora studies major with a minor in history and a minor in sociology. Um, I am a senior here at UNCG and my pronouns are she, her, hers. All right, uh, my name is Davion M. Washington Jr. Uh, I am a senior uh, at the University of Lynchburg. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and uh, I'm a sociology major with a triple minor in history, political science, and popular culture. Oh, did not know you could triple minor, cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, where are you from? I, I am born and raised from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, and so describe your experience growing up there. My experience was, <clears throat> sure, is a is a different experience. I didn't grow up on the best side of town, um, per se. I grew up in like the West Charlotte area, um, West Charlotte, East Charlotte area, and um, <clears throat> and so. One thing that I always say is like a, a lot of my life has been uh, has been dictated by like my education and my schooling. Um, going to Montessori school, which was which was very different from the traditional schools and especially the schools in the areas in which I lived. So I think that I give that a lot of credit for kind of my experiences growing up because I feel like. Um, the way schools are, we know how schools are funded through property taxes and different things like that. And so schools in one area may not be as good as a school in another, but being a part of a magnet program um, and being able to go to a, a Montessori school and get a Montessori education that taught me about uh, social justice and uh, different walks of life and just independent learning really prepared me and kind of um, really informed kind of how I navigate the world. <clears throat> I was in Montessori school from um, pre-K up until uh, the eighth grade. So high school was my first year of traditional school. Um, and even then I went to the largest high school, largest public high school in North Carolina. Um, and that also kind of informed, you know, a lot of my you know, the way I kind of came up as well, getting to be around such a diverse population, even in a high school, far different from what I kind of experience now. Um, it, was a, it was a pretty cool opportunity to just be around so many different people and learn from them and engage with them. All right. Um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I was going to ask, uh, how, how was your neighborhood? What was your neighborhood like? So... That's kind of a tough question because I've, I've moved around a lot uh, in my lifetime. Always been in Charlotte, but I've moved around a lot. So I've never got to like call a, a place my specific neighborhood. I guess the neighborhood that I would really call my neighborhood is, is where my grandma lives. It's Arrowwood, Arrowwood and Winsong Trails. And um, again, it's not the, not the, best part, um, not the best parts. I've grown up, you know, on, on West Boulevard in Charlotte, North Carolina and co apartment communities um, uh, surrounded by like constant violence, you know, people hanging out and soliciting around stores and, and you know, different people like seeing drug deals and different things like that. Um, or, or, you know, being in you know, predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods and, and, and kind of being around them and being immersed in, in all of that. Um, so my neighborhoods, the, the plethora of neighborhoods that I've been in have all been different, but they've all had kind of some, kind of some striking similarities as far as uh, really, you know, just the presence of like, you know, what they called it, what people would call a bad neighborhood. 
I called home and, you know, on the inside of it, we found and we created community within these neighborhoods. Um, everybody knew each other regardless, you know. Um, the whole neighborhood was like a family and yeah, they're, you know, what, you know, some of the deviant behavior that's deemed by society um, was often highlighted and our neighborhoods were highlighted, but we kind of found um, togetherness, you know, in our community. Okay. Okay. So um, while you were growing up, did you experience any racism? And, and if you did, how did you handle that? I mean, certainly, uh, certainly did experience some racism. My mom is from Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is about 30 minutes south of Charlotte. Um, a number of different, you know, just, you know, underlying racist, you know, things that have taken place both in Rock Hill and in Charlotte. I've been called, you know, the N-word before and being, being so, so little and, and not knowing any better. Um, just just not really thinking much of it. I remember one time, um, you know, being at the mall with a group of friends um, for one of my birthdays actually. And us just walking around like a group of maybe about four or five uh, young African-American men and uh, somebody stopping us and saying like, um, I just overheard on the securities walkies to keep to that they were told to keep an eye out on y'all, uh, to keep an eye out on the the, the black the group of black guys, um, and so just different things like that. The different conversations that I've had in high school and middle school, um, some things that people may call political differences, when in all actuality they're they're more you know fundamental differences and in ideology, and, and some of those differences are racism. <laughs> so um, to, to say that, you know, I've experienced racism is, is, is an understatement. I think that um, like we're socialized by and in, into racism, into a, a racist society, you know. So, yeah. Okay. So in any other, any of the racist experiences that you did have and that you said about, um, for your example, at the mall, like how did you navigate those experiences or how do you navigate any experiences like that? Um, I think it takes a moment to hit you, really. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you, you process it like up front, but it really takes a moment to, uh, to just, to just settle in and, and really hit you like, dang, that really happened. So like in the moment, we was just like, you know, bump that, like that's that's messed up. But later, like it really affects you once you think about it later on and it really settles in. Um, and, and it creates feelings of, you know, anger, sadness, resentment and things like that. And, and, and really it's about what you do with those feelings as to how you move forward, um, turning that, you know, that anger into, into like a passion or, 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 or turning that, you know, that pain into a passion and turning that passion into something um, that's, you know, tangible and that can right the wrongs that have been done against you. Um, so yeah. Okay, so with, that leads me into my next question, which was, which is like, um, when were you first activated, or what moment? In what moment did you realize that you were interested in activism? I think it's it's always been there, especially like in that Montessori education, being a leader. Um, I think I've always like been the type of person like. That, that wants to stand up and fight for the little guy, you know. Um, and truly, I think in, in middle school, with everything that had been going on um, in our world, uh, the social climate, and just 
realizing that I could even like engage my peers uh, was something that was phenomenal to me. I grew up reading a lot about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and other, um, you know, Black history, um, prominent Black figures in Black history. Um, and it wasn't until my freshman year of high school, though, that I ended up joining the NAACP and became really involved with that and really kind of uh, and became involved in like freshman council and different things like that. And using those outlets um, to use my voice to, to really put forth um, you know, some positive change and, and, and effective change rather than just sitting and talking about it, uh, being about it. And so through being a part of the NAACP um, and being a part of, you know, you know, student council, uh, freshman council, even playing football and just kind of saying things to like, saying things to my peers throughout, you know, there was always that level of activism uh, and it looks different for a lot of people. I'm not the type of person that's the, that's the protester. I'm the, I'm the organizer. I'm the one that's behind the scenes. I'm the one that, um, that likes to host educational programs and different things like that. And so it really started and, and really started and continued and fostered in high school early on uh, with NAACP. Um, and then my junior year, um, becoming um, the president uh, of the NAACP and really wanting to do a lot more. Um, my junior year, uh, my NAACP chapter on campus at, at, at South Mech High School won a club of the year. Um, and it's just really awesome to kind of see the work that we did. We hosted uh, one of our congresswomen. Um, we held so many different educational events um, and, it, and it got me close to, to so many different people to where I could continue to, to mobilize and engage and you know just continue to be active, an active voice, so. Cool, I didn't know we won Club of the Year. Um, so I know that you went to some protests or at least one protest over the summer. So it was like the height of COVID, we had to wear masks and it was hot. So why did you still feel it necessary to go? You know, um, first thing is like, <laughs> I gotta say black folk are, are so responsible people because because uh, Reverend Karim Mack was not playing about folks wearing their masks. That was like priority number one. Like we know that there's a pandemic. Um, we know that there's a pandemic, but there's there's another pandemic as well. And it's the, the one that keeps, you know, killing unarmed black people um, and not, you know, bringing justice to those individuals. Um, you know, if I'm going to go out, <laughs> it's going to be for doing the right thing, really. Um, so it was amazing to see. I think there was like over a million people out in Charlotte when NAACP hosted the, the march um, in, in downtown Charlotte. And everybody was wearing their mask. Everyone was compliant. Um, I just want to highlight that there were no records of COVID spikes from protests. First of all, <laughs> um, uh, and it was just beautiful to see. Like it was necessary because you know, like I've had I've had conversations with some people that say like, you know. You, people don't need a protest. People don't need to need a riot and different things like that. I know that there are some people that talk down about looting and other and rioting and other things like that. But you know, 
we could loot the entire country and it still won't be adequate to what has been taken from us and where we have been taken from. Um, everybody, I know like this has been an election year. I have some very contrarian views about a lot of different things. Everybody thinks that voting is the answer. Well, most people act like voting is the answer and the end all be all, vote, vote, vote. Um, one of my favorite, like one of my role models is W.E.B. Du Bois, um, he's a founder of the NAACP, one of the founders of the NAACP, uh, an alpha man, and, uh, and one of the fathers uh, of American sociology, uh, especially when it comes to critical race theory. And um, in, in his book, uh, The Souls of Black Folk, he starts one of the chapters out and saying that, you know, African Americans, to African Americans, um, they use, we use the ballot in sheer self defense. It is never, if, if an election was a game, we'd be using the ballot as defense and rather than offense. Every time there's an election, it's, it's the sentiment of, we're making sure this person doesn't get in rather than the sentiments of we're making sure this candidate whom we fully support does get in. It seems like no candidate has never been fully on board with the plight of black people. And instead we're playing defense, trying to, trying to keep the one candidate out who is most harmful. It's this, that the lesser of two evils. And so, we know when it comes to you know African Americans, we lose every election. <laughs> um, you know, Bill Clinton had the crime bill. George Bush, uh, George Bush. You know, <laughs> even like people forget that this Black Lives Matter stuff happened under Obama and started under Obama, and 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 all the horrendous things that Trump has said, we know that we're going to be picking the less of the evils, which means that we know that we're stuck with evil regardless. So the ballot and voting is not the end all be all. The protest is the end all, well, not the end all be all. The protest is holding feet to the fire. The same way the protest is what our country was founded on. That's when, that's when they threw tea into the, to the Boston Harbor and all these other different things. And, and it created change. It was something that was tangible. They realized, people at some point realized, either one, they asked themselves, why are these people so upset to, to where they're gathering in this kind of angry fashion? And how can we address it? Or when it was ignored, it resulted in revolution. And that's how the change came about. Uh, the American Revolution started in protest and anger. And when they were ignored, it was a revolution. Now, now when now when white folk does it, it's 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 uh <laughs> It's it, it starts a whole country and 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 all of this stuff. And when we do it, it's uh, we're thugs and criminals and we're inciting violence and we're and we're looting and rioting and things like that. But lo and behold, I go up to school in Virginia. I bet you some cars got flipped over and set on fire when UVA won that basketball tournament two years ago. And nobody said a word. But there are people out here fighting for their lives and nobody's asking the question, why are these people responding like this? It's a constant, there's a trend. I'm, I'm a sociologist or a self-proclaimed sociologist. There's a constant trend in why in that that's taking place. There is protest and then most of the time during the day, the protests are peaceful. The NAACP protests went perfect. We left, but then 
there begins some form of agitation. People are still angry. Looting is a trend, rioting is a trend. Why are we not addressing the trend? We're just addressing the fact that people shouldn't do it. It's, it's secondhand oppression. <laughs> um, you know, nobody's addressing, again, like I said, like what, what's the cause of this? And so history shows us that when nobody addressed what the cause was that was, came revolution. Protests have got us so many things. An election did not get us um, the Civil Rights Act. You know, protested days and nights of protest got us those acts. Election didn't get us the 14th Amendment. So, the, you know, protest has always been a valid response to injustice. And it has always been, uh, it has always been, and it has always created tangible change. And so that's why, that's why it's so important because for us, we play defense when we go vote. We play offense when we go protest and when we go, um, when we go advocate, when we go and hold the, our representatives' feet to the fire. So yeah, that was well said. Um, well, you kind of touched on it a little bit when you said. Um, it was about a million people at the protest, but I was gonna ask you, what did you see and experience at the protest? <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. I so so here's the funny thing. I was actually supposed to, I was actually supposed to speak at that protest. Uh, I know John Gray, who is who kind of took over for the NAACP chapter at South After Me. He was there and he spoke. I was invited to actually come up and speak. And I wasn't thinking it was gonna be as big as it was. I don't know how it got spread like that, but once I showed up, I showed up like, like maybe right on time. I thought I would have been able to get to the front easily. It was so many people, I didn't even end up speaking. I couldn't even get close to the front. And, um, and so it was, it was just incredible to see the amount of people that were there. And we, like we literally had blocked traffic off. We did a whole entire circle around Uptown Charlotte and traffic was blocked off. People were literally at the lights and they just parked and got out their cars and were sitting there. Um, some of them cheering us on, some of them just looking in awe, some of them looking aggravated. And, um, I always say like, yes, this is like, people act like, like, let me, let me go back and just say like, I always say that a protest, a protest with permission is just a parade. A protest with permission is just a parade. Protest um, uh, and other things like that are a form of civil disobedience. They're supposed to cause a disruption they're not supposed to be some form of like performative mess that's done just to say like, oh, look at this, look at the camera, all these people are marching and, and they were led by the police. I've been a part of protests that where they were like, oh, the police joined in and they blocked off the streets and, and the street was shut down for the day. That's performative. Protests with permission is just a parade people's days were ruined who were probably waiting at those lights and could not get through. And the only thing that I could think about is you think your day was messed up by these people marching. I'm pretty sure George Floyd had plans. He probably had plans for the week, plans for the month, plans for the year, plans for the rest of his life that he did not get to fulfill. Your day will be okay it's supposed to be disruptive. And there was, there was beauty in the amount of people that came together out there. Um, I was there with my mom, my dad, 
Um, my little brother was out there. Um, that was his first kind of time being able to participate in something like that and, and his first leap into activism. And it was just, you know, amazing just to be out there and see all the people that truly cared. Um, that night was the same night that, you know, CMPD blocked in people on four sides and then started tear gassing them. Um, and that started just a whole lot of different things, but um, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing and people, I did not feel alone. People were speaking out against, you know, just all the wrongdoings, the injustices, and really starting at the root of it all, saying like, like I remember John Gray saying, if you consider yourself to be a good person and you're a cop, quit. <laughs> like I was, every, and everybody lost it. But it's like thinking about the root of like these institutions and how inherently white and inherently racist that they are. I know some people have good intentions to kind of join in and, and kind of assimilate into the ranks in order to change it from within. It's much more difficult. So, I mean, it was it was just a it was a sight to see. I actually had I actually gave a I gave a presentation on Tuesday night because we're actually I'm trying to get an NAACP chapter started here on my campus, and I used some pictures from that uh, from that protest, and I joked I was like, if you look into this large crowd, <laughs> you can see me. <laughs> Um, but yeah. Uh, would you say it was diverse or was it very much more black than anything else? It was absolutely diverse. Everyone was out there. Black, white, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, Asian, uh, everyone. There were so many faces and I was like, this is, you know, we always chant like this is what democracy looks like and, and that and it was so beautiful just to see the number of people that were out there and that really, you know, wanted to come together and stand for something. So you mentioned you've been at different protests. How many protests would you say you've been to? Um, maybe like four or five. And were they all protesting for the generally the same thing, or did you uh, have different protests, different types of protests? Um, normally, yeah, general, generally around the same thing. Um, I've attended, you know, HK on J in, in Raleigh, which is uh, 100 Thousands on Jones Street. It's a yearly march that takes place, uh, that's hosted by the NAACP. Um, and um, yeah, generally around the same things, just, you know, not necessarily all being like, you know, police brutality, but, you know, advocating for minorities and people of color and, and for the equality of all people. So, okay, so by protesting, what do you hope to achieve? You know, I hope, I hope to be heard. I think that's what everyone wants is just to be heard. And the anger comes from when people aren't feeling heard. Um, when there is, you know, a response to protests and not just performative crap. Like, like I think that's the biggest thing is like lately, like people keep trying to give us performative crap we said to fund the police and Nancy Pelosi went outside and painted the street <laughs> <laughs> uh, or put on kente stoles in Congress and, <laughs> and whatever else. Like, that's not feeling heard. That's like, yeah, we're gonna give you black folk uh, what we think y'all need and, and take it or leave it. You know, that's not feeling heard. We wanna feel heard and we wanna see some tangible change from protesting 
Um, I think it's amazing, like even like on Charlotte, Charlotte City Council to have people like, you know, Braxton Winston, uh, who, you know, really was a part of that, you know, when Keith Lamont Scott um, got killed, was part like was a leader in those in those protests and, and, and became a member of our city council. Um, so I think there's, there's just so much to, uh, you know, there's so much we wanna see get be tangibly done. And um, I don't think people are, are gonna be satisfied until they, you know, until it really happens. All right, so do you have any specific suggestions on how to, this might be like a very, you know, difficult question, but do you have any specific suggestions on how to reform society to equally include Black people? I have so many different answers because I, I have so many different networks that advocate for so many different things. Like I said before, um, there's some people who try to go and, and work within the system to really bring about change. I think we see that in, uh, you know, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, um, what do they call them, the squad? Like those are people that are trying to work within the system to truly change it. I think that's, there are some people that I, um, that I follow and keep up with. Um, I don't know if anybody's, if you've ever heard of the Black Hammer organization, but they believe that, um, you know, working within the system or even being a part of a system, um, not to speak for them, is basically, um, is being complicit within the system. Um, and you really have to uproot the system and we have to really start with the fact that, you know, we're living in a, in a society uh, that was basically placed on stolen land. Um, and so there's, there's so much to kind of, you know, unwrap and unravel with that. Um, there's some people that, you know, aren't all gung-ho about, you know, completely like dismantling the system, destroying it, but really like is looking at certain institutions, um, those critical scholars um, that really like address certain systems. Um, you know, I'm a member of a third party here uh, in the United States and um, there are people who advocate for, you know, having more options for representation of the American people because um, our system right now is inherently, you know, just unfair and doesn't give, truly give people the options that they, that they want and deserve um, and puts others at a disadvantage. So there are a number of different ways to go about it. The, pol the police don't need that much money. Uh, they just voted to, to uh, I don't even know what the vote was, but there was a vote about a $5 million helicopter for CMPD. I'm like, they have helicopters already. There are teachers that are buying their own school supplies for their students in their classrooms. You know, we, we don't inhibit crime by creating more forces of it. We inhibit crime by creating, uh, you know, more students, more scholars, more people that have that that find joy um, and comfort. I think the thing is, like you know, when we think of sociology, we think of strain and strain theory and how people feel strain. Um, because they're at a disadvantage. There are people that feel like they have to sell drugs because every other option isn't, isn't good enough. It's too slow for them. It's not sustaining them. Uh, 
uh, and so many other different things, there's a, a clear strain. So it's not about enforcing the strain. We're too busy wrapped up in enforcing the strain rather than limiting it by giving people the opportunities that they want, need, and deserve and making sure that they can live a comfortable life and not feel the need that they need to like, that they have to want for more, you know? So that's, that's kind of where I would start out is, is, is providing more funding to where, you know, we're funding, you know, housing for people so that people can live, especially we keep building more housing, more and more housing that, that gives you less and less space it costs way more. It makes sense. It's backwards. And um, and then we're, we're taking so much out of our schools. We're, we're basically teaching kids that the arts are not important and that you cannot get, have a sustainable job through the arts. Um, you know, the other thing is like we teach people like Like there's a need for essential workers, fast food workers, grocery store workers and things like that. And I think that's been highlighted more now because of the pandemic, but it's like our society also teaches us that that's not good enough because those jobs aren't even paying you enough to where you can live a comfortable life. So it's, yeah, we have to start by, by, uh, limiting the strain rather than putting all our effort into enforcing and basically dictating those who are, who are strained. All right, right. That makes perfect sense, actually. Um, so you mentioned you are part of the NAACP. Are you a part of any other organizations, local or national, that are like involved in the same types of things, organizing protests, political change, racial equality, stuff like that? Yes, yes. So um, I'm a part of the NAACP. I'm a member of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I am a member of the Green Party of North Carolina, uh, which is, you know, the party for, you know, you know, eco-socialism, grassroots organizing. Um, you know, I serve as an, a college ambassador for the Young Black Leadership Alliance, which is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm extremely involved in, in different ways. So, uh, and I am a, a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church. So. Um, really a lot of different things that really foster f further activism and um yeah you are extremely involved so <laughs> you had mentioned earlier about you're more into organizing than necessarily protesting have you actually like have, how many hands-on experience have you had like organizing the pro a protest or or something of that sort so, I, you know, I really am, I think my protest is my scholarship. Um, I've worked in organizations that have organized protests, but I won't say I had the most hands on a protest in particular. Um, you know, even when we, going back to South Met, when I kind of organized all of us to come together and paint the rock <laughs> outside in front of the school. And we know how much of a hot mess that was. Um, but, um, you know, educational events and my scholarship are really kind of my form of organizing and protest. So um, we've hosted events, like I said, with Congress, Congress people, um, congressmen and women, um, educational events, discussions, forums, debates um, that bring people into the room and have them to to talk. I think one thing I don't believe in is having isolated conversations. I want to talk to the people that that think that, you know, Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization or whatever else that is, because um, 
I want to figure out why you think that or what gave you that impression. Um, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that at some points we'll realize that our paths cross in a certain way. Um, but also, um, I'm currently, you know, seeking to get my, my PhD in sociology and uh, using my academic work to kind of provide suggestions and tangible resources and programming to, to different facets of life. So right now my kind of focus is, is higher education and, and African-American students, um, basically understanding the lived experiences of African-American students at predominantly white institutions and um, using kind of the dimensions of wellness uh, as a framework to kind of gauge these experiences and then using my research um, in that realm to provide, you know, accreditors or institutions, different suggestions or things that they can add to strategic plans and, and so on and so forth. And so um, that's even a part of my kind of protest and my change and my advocacy. I like that scholarship education, very important. Okay, so this year alone, we have seen so, a, like quite a few racially charged incidents like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, just to name a few. Can you talk a little bit about your feelings in regards to the decisions, the police work, and just your initial reactions to them? Every We live in a country to where like our leadership is, is rather reactive to black pain and suffering rather than they are proactive. Rather than doing work that prevents the pain and suffering of black people. I don't think, like people talk about how like police kill more white people but when it comes to numbers, it's disproportionate. And then we don't get on social media every other week and see videos of un unarmed white people getting killed. I think black people have, have like the thickest skin because we're constantly tortured. Like we have to get on the internet. Do you tell me anybody else that has to get on the internet every other week and see someone that looks like them really being murdered on camera? I think that's that's so incredibly frustrating, but it's one of the most bizarre things that is that is America. Like, oh, it's a normal thing to see black people on the internet. Like getting killed like you and you don't think people are going to be outraged or in pain like i think you know you think about even in in louisville when they had preemptively called in the national guard preemptively called in their riot squads before the decision was handed down about Breonna Taylor, they are more proactive about policing Black people rather than helping to ease Black pain and suffering. And they're more reactive to our anger. Whenever there's a protest, a riot, or some, or some looting occurs, it's you know, even like Joe Biden, look at Joe Biden, Kamala Harris's statement, Kamala Harris's statement. And it's like the paragraph about the injustices is this big. The paragraph condemning rioting and looting is about this big. It's like, you truly show what you care about. You care about the items, the goods, the capitalism and things like that. You don't necessarily deeply care enough about black lives or black pain and suffering. And it's frustrating because I see so much reactiveness by the police to where they'll, you know, 
oh, protest is breaking up, ha happening. We should give, like, clearly every time the police show up to a protest, it clearly doesn't make it better. Right. Like, well, that's, that's, that's obvious. But yet and still, we think we should give them more money, even though people are angry at them in their presence. And we don't think that we should invest in more things that will alleviate and, you know, make, you know, the murdering of innocent Black people zero to none, you know, it doesn't make sense. So I think that's one of the most infuriating things about it all is like just the response. Um, it's, yeah, it's infuriating. So speaking of police interactions and encounters, have you had any encounters with the police or any, well, any negative encounters with police? I've actually tried to like work like in my in 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 my past, especially in in high school, I tried to do a lot of community work with the police. Um, so outside of of protests and things like that, I cannot say that I've had negative interactions with the police. But I think everyone, especially people of color have this like it's not like the police for people of color it's not like the police are there to to protect you even though they're to serve or protect but it's like police people of color don't operate as if those people are there to protect you you see a police car drive by and you slow down a little bit even if you're not driving too fast right. you know you see an officer walk past and you you just act try to act you know you try not to act suspicious even if you weren't acting suspicious before, <laughs> like you put your guard up immediately. And that's not like a server protect mentality. And even that happens to me. And I've worked with police officers. I've been on ride alongs. I've done advocacy for body worn camera systems. Um, I've done community conversations with police officers. Um, I know your dad's a police officer. And, uh, and you know, we. I've even, you know, talk to him sometimes and things like that. But um, it's just this air about it that's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a clear like response that black people have to the presence of police officers that does not indicate like, oh, hey, person that's supposed to be protecting me, <laughs> you know? Right, right. So, the election, um, you said you remember the third party. So I guess this really wasn't exactly what we wanted. But I mean, uh, what are your thoughts on the election and the results of it? Um, we got one, we kicked one fascist out. We're bringing another one in. Again, like I said, Black folk lose over time. Joe Biden, like on the campaign trail, like I was happy that Donald Trump was out uh, and, and, and having a familiar face, a, a good familiar face back in the White House is a relief, but he kicked himself in the butt so many times and during his campaigning. You know, if you're not, if, you're not black, you don't vote for me, you know, or, you know, all these other different comments and things like that. Oh, I beat those other guys. I think we need more police and give the police more money. And, uh, and uh, you know, some of the campaign stuff was just like, it was like two centrist, like a centrist and a hardcore uh, far right Republican arguing with each other and everybody who like you don't even have to be political but if you deeply care about other people like those people are sitting there looking like what in the world is this um so again like it's not time for brunch now just because joe biden won the election it's time to get out in the streets even more it's time to hold his feet even more to the fire because he's he's harmed black people in the past 
that's not up for debate. And so has Kamala Harris. Um, so we really have to, you know, continue to hold them accountable because if they've done it before, who says they won't do it again? All right. And so this brings me to my final question. What do you hope will change with this new leadership? Well, for starters, I hope I can get some health insurance because <laughs> I ain't had none of that for four years. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, seriously, um, a lot of these executive orders have to be repealed. The one that really got me was the, um, the banning of critical race theory in like government training or government funded programs. And that's like literally, that's literally what I, my, my scholarship is immersed in. Um, and so, you know, definitely, you know, securing the rights of the LGBTQIA plus community. It's, it's so unfortunate that every four years, there's a group of people that have to go and vote for their humanity, for their right to, to be normalized, you know. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, Roe v. Wade isn't overturned because, you know, people think that everybody on the right just wants to kill the babies, even though, even though pro-choice is not pro-abortion, it's just, it's basically like, I don't care what you do because it's not my business. I don't control them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and nobody's going around like saying, oh yeah, I just got an abortion. Like nobody's, nobody's, nobody's doing that. It's to protect people's lives, really. Um, and things like that. So it's just stuff like that. Like basically, I hope that, you know, I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I hope like the, the human rights that were kind of most at risk and most and like immediately taken away uh, at first. I hope those are restored because those are the most tangible and close, close things that we can restore. But people, but people, we also want to see more change than we normally have um, from you know so many different um, different facets of life and things like that. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's really the biggest thing is just want to make sure that everybody is, um, uh, you know, we want to, I don't know, you know, I want to see, I want to see kids that have been in cages that are returned to their families. I want to see, you know, our immigration policies, our immigration policies are so inherently white and racist. Because, you know, most of our illegal immigrants aren't the brown people that live south of the border. And it's and there's so much hatred towards them solely because they are brown and people refuse to admit that. But it's from a lot of white people uh, who overstay visas and different things like that. And I just hope that that policy has changed because our, our immigration system is just so inherently uh, racist um, towards people of color in particular. And so those, those are some of the things that, that I want to see change. It's really changing the things that were undone over the last four years and putting them back in place. But then we have to go further than that and say like, okay, like but Obama did a lot of stuff for the LGBTQI plus community. What is going to be done for African-American People. Joe Biden said he owes African Americans. Well, well, what are you gonna do? That's that's what I'm waiting to see. Well, I definitely agree. The LGBTQ community definitely deserves a lot more, and it sucks that they have to keep advocating for that every four years. Right. But um, thank you so much. Absolutely.
Vale.